Welcome to Real Vision Live. I'm the host for today, Ed Harrison, and I have the distinct pleasure of talking to FFTT founder and president, Luke Groman. Luke, welcome back to Real Vision. Excited to be here, Edward. It's great catching up with you. I always love talking. Uh, me as well. And as you know, I said right before this, I was preparing. I'm, I was super pumped, I said, to have this conversation with you. And in particular, because I was reading one of your missives where you were going over the recent change that you had with regard to how you're thinking about the dollar. And when you're changing how you think about the dollar, you're changing you know, a whole narrative in terms of the reflation trade, and there's a whole nexus of things associated with that. So let's go through you know, your macro um, backdrop to get an understanding of what's changed since the last time you and I spoke. Sure. So back on January 11th, we wrote a report for our clients entitled U.S. Dollar and Volatility Likely to Rise Until Something Breaks as U.S. Moves to Defend the Dollar System. And uh, it's, a, it's a tactical shift that we've made. Uh, I don't know how long it will last, but um, the gist of it was that the Fed really came into this year cornered in a way uh, that I don't know that was fully appreciated. And what I mean by that is you had a situation where the U.S. Uh, needs more stimulus. Uh, you were seeing rates rise and the dollar fall, which, as uh, my friend Louis Gav says, always sets off alarm bells in his head because that's a sign of a balance of payments problem. It's a sign of a currency crisis when your currency is falling and your yields are rising. Um, you had the dollar already sitting at pretty key technical levels in the 88, 89 range on, on the Dixie. Uh, and so more stimulus, more dollar weakness risked touching off a more chaotic uh, decline in the dollar. Uh, and really, I think the Fed's biggest fear is um, the, the, the combination of declining dollar declining asset prices, because that then suggests capital flight, un, uh, uh, um, significant capital flight uh, in a real way. Um, and so you're looking at this nightmare scenario for the Fed, where they're, they're, they're the government, the domestic U.S. government needs more stimulus, really needs the Fed to monetize that stimulus, because the, the balance sheet and the global uh, market, foreign creditors, et cetera, private sector, foreign official sector, the, the balance sheet doesn't exist really to absorb uh, very much of those deficits. Yet the dollar is already at key technical levels where you could touch off a chaotic decline in the dollar and capital outflows driving U.S. equity selling, at which point the Fed's only playbook would be to significantly raise rates, break the economy, basically run run the Paul Volcker playbook in 1980. And, and that's a whole separate issue. So we we our, our point was that it looked like uh, the Fed was cornered and uh, Two things really grabbed our attention uh, in December and January that led to this tactical shift. And there were two op-eds written by, first by former uh, Treasury Secretary and Goldman CEO Hank Paulson back in, call it mid-December, entitled China Wants to Be the World's Banker. And then another one by Kevin Warsh, former Fed Governor Kevin Warsh in early January, um, and all talking about the same thing, that basically there's this uh, capital outflow to China. And they both highlight, uh, to, to paraphrase my friend Brent Johnson, that China was drinking the U.S.'s milkshake. Uh, China's rates were higher. You were seeing significant capital flows to China. You're seeing dollar weakness. Um, and so basically, these two op-eds were almost to us a, a read that um, an admonish. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. It was to China, you're seeing dollar weakness. Um, and so basically these two op-eds were almost to us a, a read that 
um, an admonishment to policymakers to, to, to basically start paying attention to the dollar. And in, when, when we paired that with what we started seeing in the fundamentals and, and by uh, the macroeconomic fundamentals, and what I mean by that is in 2020, the Fed bought more than 100 percent of U.S. Treasury net issuance. The Fed effectively monetized U.S. deficit in 2020. In 2021, the plan right now is for the Fed to buy significantly less than 100 percent of U.S. Treasury net issuance. And so when you look at those two things, when you look at the admonishment from Warsh and Paulson, it sets up actually um, uh, something that was written about by Soros and Druckenmiller and, and was discussed early on in the Trump administration, which was something we've referred to as the Soros Druckenmiller strong dollar playbook, which is if you run tighter monetary policy at the same time that you increase U.S. deficits, increase fiscal, what you end up doing is uh, driving a stronger dollar, uh, driving higher equity prices, driving, driving higher interest rates, uh, as you begin to, to, to bring capital back into the U.S., attract capital to the dollar. And so in the context of what Warsh and Paulson indicated or admonished policymakers to do, to us, this sign that the Fed was not going to buy enough treasuries in 2021, as opposed to buying more than enough in 2020, suggested a near-term bottom in the dollar, particularly when you uh, married it up with the factors we laid out before. And so... Uh, Paradoxically, at a time where no one's talking about the dollar milkshake anymore, it looks like the Fed, uh, the Fed and the U.S. are starting to run the dollar milkshake again, to, to use our, our friend Brent Johnson's phrase. And now, this is a tactical move. Uh, back in 2018 was the last time the U.S. tried to do this. Uh, back in 2Q18, after you had the sell-offs in 1Q18 in the markets where the dollar actually fell and rates were rising, same kind of thing. You saw the Fed basically move to defend the dollar. Same thing. Tighter monetary looser fiscal via the tax cuts, you, you crowded out global dollar markets, you attracted dollar capital, the US, US uh, dollar rose, US equities rose, US rates rose. That lasted for about four, maybe five months until 4Q18, and then all those factors basically blew up risk assets. And I think the same thing's gonna happen again if the US tries to run this playbook for too long. And critically, given the much greater leverage in the system, I don't think we have four or five months. I think this is a brief bounce respite in the dollar as we are effectively uh, running the Soros, Druck and Miller strong dollar playbook for a period of time. Uh, but I, that was really the crux of our, of our tactical shift in view that we wrote about for our clients on January 11th. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, a lot of things to pick apart there. The first thing that I would say, one of the comments that you made that uh, uh, caught my eye was the fact that the Fed is buying less than 100 percent, much less than 100 percent of the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Treasury issuance. I would say that's de facto uh, uh, tapering uh, in that sense. And what I'm thinking about is the uh, de facto tapering is obviously dollar bullish. How do you think about that? I agree. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's the first part of this. Now, uh, when I was on Twitter, I was asking you, I was saying to you that the thing that I'm looking at as someone who follows bonds is the the yield curve, how the yield curve is, is going and what are the reasons that it's going there. What I see is a two year, which is basically flat since uh, we've had the reopening. In fact, it's probably slightly down. You know, it's down to 11 or 12 basis points from anywhere from, you know, 15 to 20. And the difference to the 10 year is expanding over time. We got to 119 at one point, at which point the equity market puked and, you know, we backed off. We went down towards the one level. But it seems like we're in this new range now with one, uh, you know, one percent as the, the bar at the bottom. And now we're trending up slightly. We're at 114, 115 as you and I speak. Talk to me about uh, what's happening there and what's causing that. Is it related to this uh, lack of uh, soaking up of U.S. dollar deficits by the Fed? Yes, in short, I think it is. I think uh, the 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 narrative is is primarily primarily that it's around reflation and i think there's absolutely an element to it but to me the under 
reported side of this continues to be this broader, this bigger picture dynamic that we've been talking about ad nauseum uh, since 3Q14, which is foreign central banks have stopped buying treasuries on net over the last seven years. They haven't bought a single treasury on net uh, for an official sector. Uh, the global private sector um, ultimately can pick up the uh, slack, particularly now that the dollar has fallen the way it has. Uh, that helps uh, make adjustments within FX hedging markets that make uh, FX hedge treasury yields more attractive to the foreign private sector. But ultimately, when you look at the size of these deficits and the projected size of these deficits, there simply isn't enough global private sector balance sheet to finance deficits, uh, the U.S. deficits, on their own. And so you're seeing basically the price of these bonds fall. You're seeing rates rise. And so I think that's the dynamic we're in. And I think the $64,000 question to your point is, is what's the level on the 10-year um, that, that causes things to break? And uh, because that's where things, really what we're talking about here is a U.S. balance of payments problem. Uh, it's not a reflation. Now, we're going to get our reflation as a result of the response, uh, the Fed response to uh, this U.S. balance of payments problem. Um, that, but, but ultimately, that's what I think we're watching in terms of uh, this yield curve steepening and, and particularly what's happening at the long end. Yeah, so I, uh, by the way, as you were speaking, we got seven questions already. And uh, what I'm trying to do is just have a normal conversation. Uh, sure. And at some point, you know, once we've sort of given the macro view and we've expressed everything, we can start to pepper these these questions in. But you know, Perfect. the more questions we get, the 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 less time we have because I want to make sure that people get a chance to uh, to pick your brain as well. Um, I, I was thinking there are a number of things I was thinking with regard to that. Uh, one, two two things in particular. Uh, just in case I forget the second, the the first thing that's always on my mind. Uh, with regard to balance of payments and yield curves is the dichotomy between what's happening in the UK and the US. Um, and l let's run with this question. The concept that just today uh, the BOE told a UK bank that you have six months to prepare for negative interest rates. And if you look at uh, just sort of the macro picture there in the UK, it's very similar to how it is in the US. They're running a current account deficit. They're running a massive budget deficit. They also have a fiat currency where the the alignment of the central bank and the government is 100 percent. So they can finance those uh, deficits through quantitative easing or whatever else they wanted to do. But, you know, the yield curve in the UK looks very different than the United States, both in terms of levels and also steepness. And now the UK uh, central bank is saying, we're, you prepare yourself for negative interest rates. In fact, the shortening of the curve in the UK is negative, whereas in the US, it's not. And we have a steepening yield curve. It sounds to me, just looking at those two, as if the market is saying, actually, the UK, we believe you, Bank of England, that you're going to do more uh, to uh, to keep the, the, the sterling low and to monetize these deficits, whereas they're saying, no, we're sort of on the sideline. You know, we don't know if the Fed is really going to come for for bad things happen. The, so talk to me about how you look at this dichotomy between what's happening in the UK with negative interest rates and what's happening with the US. So I, it's a really interesting question. It's a really interesting point. I, I think at least some and maybe some big part of the difference is tied to the dollar as reserve status and the treasury bond as global primary reserve asset, or at least incumbent global primary reserve asset, which is to say the Bank of England is, I think, operating under a uh, a, a system of do what's best for the uh, what they perceive to be best for uh, the economy. Uh, and the country and financing the government. And that's their sole mandate. And the Fed uh, has really, in this context, uh, not just the domestic economy mandate, but the the management of the global reserve currency mandate. It's the old Triffin's dilemma. And 
one of our recent reports, we referred to a great line in the movie, <laughs> Sweet Home Alabama. My wife, my wife loves these rom-coms, so I've seen it. But there's a great scene in it where the, the girl's trying to pick which guy, you know, to date and, and or uh, to, to, to date. And her dad says, look, you, you can't ride two horses with one ass, sugar bean. And so the Fed is is trying to ride two horses with one, with one ass. And then the Bank of England has already picked their horse. They're, they're willing to let the currency do what it's going to do. They can move to negative interest rates because they don't have the reserve currency. Uh, the issue for the Fed is if they move to negative nominal rates, um, there's seven trillion plus in dollar denominated FX reserves sitting around the world. And uh, if they move into negative territory, uh, where that's basically the Fed declaring that we are going to start stealing back via negative rates the sur accrued surpluses you have earned from trading with the United States over the past 50 years under the dollar-centric system, it would stand to reason that that $7 trillion would start bidding for 0% for high-yield uh, FX reserve or reserve asset alternatives. And on top of that list is gold. Um, and you can argue now as Bitcoin gets bigger, Bitcoin. Um, and so what you would what the Fed has to manage um, that the Bank of England really doesn't is this reserve currency management dynamic. And if, if China was still um, a small player in the world like they were 20 years ago, the Fed might be able to get away with doing it anyway, with running the BOE playbook. But the reality is the Chinese are offering 3% plus on the Chinese tenure. And yeah, they have capital controls. And yeah, there are rules of law differences and, and, and. It all comes down to we're at one and they're at three. Do you feel like that extra 2% pickup in this world is enough to compensate you for those risks? And those risks. And what we've seen over the last nine months, six months, whatever you want to look at, the world is saying on the margin, we're willing to take that risk. You can see the capital flows moving there. Goldman came out a couple of weeks ago and said they expect $140 billion of bond flows to China this year. That's $140 billion of capital that under the old, the way the system used to work, uh, belonged in the treasury market. That's our money going to China. Uh, and so that, I think, is really uh, the dynamic. I don't know if it's so much that people don't believe the Fed can do it. I think it is more that the Fed's trying to ride two horses with one ass, and those horses are increasingly riding in diametrically opposite directions. And uh, they're going to have to make a choice really soon. And that ultimately ties back to why I think uh, this dollar bounce probably won't last all that long. Right. Very interesting. Uh, so why don't we pivot for a second? I want to get the second thing that I was going to ask you about were the, uh, was the stimulus package. But let's go back to that because I want to pivot to China since you're talking about China. I think that that, that dynamic is interesting, especially when you think about coronavirus, where the Chinese there that's where the coronavirus started they seem to have done relatively well with uh, overcoming the problems associated with it and now they were actually the best uh, country in the world in terms of growth of the large countries in 2020 and they're back on track allowing them by the way to be able to not do massive monetary stimulus, massive fiscal stimulus in order to support their economy because their economy is still roaring along. And we're no longer at the point where they're just doing stuff in order to keep output up. There's actually demand for uh, Chinese goods and services. So th they have a 3 percent yield versus the 1 percent. Where is this headed in terms of uh, China's role in the global currency system, and also in terms of the value of the yuan. So I think ultimately the yuan's going higher, um, and probably a lot higher. Uh, your question—that's the easier part. The question, that, and it's a great question again, is it gets to the heart of, of a discussion that I've been having for a long time, and I think people are starting to really. Um, uh, sort of sort of see it play out, some of the dynamics we've been discussing, which is 
forever people tell me, Luke, the yuan is not going to replace the dollar. And forever I've been saying the yuan doesn't want to replace the dollar. China has no interest in structuring their system like the dollar system has been structured post-71 because it requires them to hollow out their manufacturing sector, send their jobs overseas somewhere else, um, run massive deficits that in the long run bankrupt their economy. And the Chinese actually plan for the long run, unlike our government, which runs two-year election cycle at best and, and from putting out fire to putting out fire. And so what China's really been doing is, is managing, try, they, don't, they don't want the yuan to replace the dollar as the dollar was from 71 to, uh, to, to present. They want to shift the system towards a multi-currency system where it is ultimately the valuation of your currency relative to other currencies is a function of your current account balance relative to those other currencies and a function of your pile of reserves relative to those other currencies. And two things about that. Number one, that's the way currencies worked uh, for basically all of human history up until 1971. And so what we think is normal is actually the biggest aberration in probably 2000 years, uh, with, with the exception of very small parts, uh, very small eras around wars. And number two, this isn't my speculation. The head of the PBOC, Zhao, uh, wrote about this in 2015, I think it was. might have been 2016, but he flat out said currencies will increasingly trade based on balance of payments, uh, current, account, current account balances, and on reserves. And so when you look at that, what all this means relative specific to your question is people say, well, what if, if I take you on, if, if Saudi or Russia take you on for their oil, uh, what are the Russians getting? The Chinese don't have a big enough bond market. And people are conditioned to think that that's the way the world works is, well, you have to have this big bond market to recycle the, the, the flows, resolve it all in the capital account, like the US has done since 71. And the reality of what China is doing is they're resolving these imbalances in the trade balance, in, in the trade account. And so what they're doing is basically, well, what's what's backing the yuan? If I have yuan, what 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 do I get for? And the answer is, is it's settled in Chinese goods. Uh, and when you look around the world at all of the nations that trade with China, number one, they're the number one or number two trading partner with basically everybody on earth. And there's this great chart that I have that shows, I think it's from the FT, it shows in 2000, the countries. Uh, that were the that, that were the biggest uh, that the U.S. was the biggest trading partner for in blue, and the ones that were the biggest trading partner for China or China was the biggest trading partner in red, and the whole global map was blue. And 20 years later, the whole global map is red with a couple of blues around you know Mexico, Canada, basically. So they're the biggest trader with everybody, and if you look at within who they're the biggest trader with, the only areas they really run deficits in are with. Uh, um, semiconductors and oil uh, commodities. And so when you look at uh, the tensions around Taiwan, it makes sense that we're seeing tensions around Taiwan given this, uh, as people are saying, it's the new oil, makes sense. And the old oil, we're seeing all these tensions around oil. We're seeing um, this increasing move, uh, you know, this con this oil contract that we've been talking about for years and which is supposed to be dead on arrival when it launched in 2018. It's not dead on arrival. There was an article earlier this week that we tweeted, you can find it on our Twitter feed, that. Volumes continue to, to, to ramp up. The Chinese are pricing the marginal barrel of oil globally in, in yuan, not dollars. And that, again, pushes towards this balance of payment system where you're effectively settling um, uh, in, in every nation's got to settle in goods. And if every nation has to settle in the goods or the production of their economy, what that suggests over time is every central bank has to finance their own government's deficits. Now, when you line up all the government's deficits, there's two countries that are by far the worst, that are, whose central banks are going to have to print the most. It's, to your point earlier, the UK, uh, who is does not have to worry about managing the, their, the global reserve currency. They can just you know, you know, continue to, to, uh, to, to print as needed. Uh, and that's what it sounds like they're doing. And the U.S., who actually has to print way more than anybody else, and it's not even close. They, they, they have so much to print to finance our deficits as a vestige of the old system, where that's how we settled was in, you know, through the capital account and treasuries. Uh, but within this move that the U.S. is going to print the most, 
uh, by far, there are these periods of time where if they just straight print the most, the dollar will collapse uh, relative to these other currencies until it finds a level where we can balance our current account via U.S. production. Uh, that is several zip codes lower than here in terms of the dollar versus where where we would need the dollar to be to balance our, our, our current account uh, via trade. Um, uh, so you, the dollar really has, or the Fed really has these two dynamics where we've, you know, we, we, we need the weaker dollar, we need to finance the deficits, but we can't keep just doing it. There are times we have to pull back on the reins and we're going to try to jump over to this horse now and ride this other horse. And like I said, those horses are increasingly riding in these directions. And so the Fed's going to have to choose. And I think they're going to have to choose here in 2021. Yeah, uh, again, a lot to unpack. Uh, 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 let me uh, look at it this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin a narrative and, and you tell me what you think of it, because uh, I want to synthesize a lot of the stuff that you were talking about. The first thing that comes to mind to me when you talk about the U.S. and the U.K. and then you talk about China is a um, a tweet that I uh, had on January the 6th, and I was thinking about uh, the insurrection uh, in Washington, D.C. I was thinking of it as the U.S. is Suez, i.e., this is the marker that you can put down where it's clear that people are just like, wait a minute, wh why are we uh, thinking that the U.S. is uh, the place where there's huge stability and we should be leveraged to the U.S.? L let's uh, l you know go away from that trade slightly. And when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking of it in terms of the UK, uh, obviously, that because that was what happened to them. This was 1956 and Suez, even though it happened over a longer period of time, Suez eventually led to the UK going to the IMF and saying, help me out. And the reason that they said that is because in order to deal with the deficits that they increased over time, and uh, you, or the the debt burden that they had that was a legacy to a certain degree of the Second World War, uh, they even though they had some uh, growth in their economy, a lot of it was because of currency depreciation and to a degree inflation, and that came to a head basically in the 1970s after you had the uh, oil embargo. It was even worse in the UK. And then the government had to decide, are we going to allow our regime of currency depreciation and inflation to be upended even more by this oil embargo, or are we just going to say stop? And they decided to say stop. Uh, it's, you know, when I'm thinking about the whole thing, I'm thinking about the United States in the UK's role increasingly in that sense. And a secondary, a corollary of this is that if you look at the U.S. balance of payments, the U.S. balance of payments were relatively even in the period up until 1971. This explosion in the current account uh, deficit was a direct result of the U.S. dollar not being tethered at all to gold and the complete fiat currency era with the U.S. serving, uh, unfortunately, in the Triffin's dilemma as the world's reserve currency. So. That's sort of the narrative I would spin in terms of thinking about the moment in time that we're in right now. Uh, uh, give me your pushback or your thinking, given what I just said. I think it's I think it's I think it's a very fair and I think it's a very good baseline metaphor. And I think from there, then I think you add to um, some addendums in terms of the, the differences uh, both internal to the U.S. and external to the U.S. And so as we think about this, uh, no, no offense intended for any of my, my friends in the U.K., uh, it's a relatively smaller landmass island relative to the United States. Uh, and so the U.S. is a much more diversified, larger economy than the U.K. was then. Um, the uh, that is that is a, that's a big and important difference, I think. Right. Um, from an external standpoint, uh, the other thing that I think is different now in favor of the U.S. and things not going um, as quickly or as obviously as that metaphor is that when you compare the incumbent reserve asset country issuer, uh, U.K., to the U.S., uh, there's really not a lot of difference. You, rule of longstanding tradition, rule of, I mean, we were we were a colony that broke away. We, Anglo-Americans, there's a lot in common 
Uh, we were very good friends. Our allies were their allies. It becomes a really interest, a really easy shift, right? If you, if I go back and try to put myself in the shoes of a reserve manager in 1955, 56, 60, and I say, okay, you know, do I want money in the sterling or do I want money in the dollar? And I say, okay, well, same rule of law. Uh, they're allies. They've been allies. Um, I understand the way they do things. The Americans are a much bigger country, much bigger economy. They're the world's biggest oil producer. Uh, they're the world's biggest economy. They've got all the gold. It's a pretty easy choice. And right. you go with the Americans. This time, it's not as clear cut. Um, the incumbent system is, there is no, as I was just saying, the com big competitor is China, but China doesn't want to be the U.S. China wants a multi-currency system to kind of go back to really pre-71, but really even pre-1922 at the Genoa Conference, really almost a, 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 a multi-currency system gold standard of a, a neutral settlement asset of sorts, uh, something like McKean's uh, proposed at Bretton Woods. In fact, PBOC wrote about this is, is what they wanted in 09. The bank uh, core. The bank core, exactly. A neutral settlement asset that floats in all currencies. This is what China wants. So on that level of externalities, uh, it's already different. So we're not just going from, so there's there's some adjustments that have to take place. And one of the biggest would be multi-currency oil. And every the big five in the SDR get the price oil in their own currency is, is a big one. And you've seen the world moving towards that. That's a separate discussion we've talked about before. But the other one I think is an important um, externality that is very different. And that is culturally, politically, the Chinese are very different than the United States. There is not, you know, you could sort of, you know, the U.S. and, and, and the Anglo-American tradition, rule of law, et cetera, uh, institutions, we're all very similar. The institutions and the way the Chinese see the world versus how the Americans see the world are very different. And uh, I don't need to expound on it more than that. Everybody watching is going to understand what I mean. Uh, but the point then is, is it's no longer quite the, oh, well, it's the Americans or the, China, the, the UK. It's six of one half dozen. Now it's, you know, six of one baker's dozen, right? It's, huh. <laughs> so there are some, while the, from a purely um, uh, analytical, mathematical framework, you can and, you know, yield gaps, trade balance, uh, trading partners, et cetera. You can see the way the world's moving. The the inertia that's pushing in the other direction, the other tectonic plate is, is you know, you see what happened in Hong Kong. You see um, a difference in the way they approach things. Um, you, so that is, um, that's another balancing factor that you net against that. And at the very minimum, that tells me uh, things will take longer to develop than they did then, I think. Um all else equal, and all else may not be equal, but that's that's I think how I've thought about that sort of internal differences and external differences. Right. Yeah. And you know this concept that they're looking for bilateral trade in the currencies of the trading partners, reducing the need for the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency makes a lot of sense. And I've heard that before. You know, one wrinkle in this, I might add, just something that came out. I don't have a per personal view on it, but I saw we had a video with uh, uh, Pomp, who's a Bitcoin advocate, and Mike Green, who has some doubts about Bitcoin. And Mike Green was making the case that actually, even though you might think that the Chinese would like to crack down on Bitcoin, maybe actually they want Bitcoin to gain acceptance as a way of actually eroding the the U.S. dollar's uh, dominance within the existing uh, reserve currency status. Uh, I think, obviously, that's easier to the degree that they're not a completely open capital account. But I don't have a view that's very strong on that. Have you heard anything around that? And do you have a view yourself? I have I, I have heard that. I think there's a fair I think it's a fair point by Mike. I would take it one further. I think there are significantly politically powerful elements in the U.S. that want the same thing. Um, and up to and including the U.S. Defense Department or elements of the U.S. Defense Department and national security intelligence apparatus. And the reason I say that is the dollar system as it is currently structured, and I'm going to be blunt here because you have to be blunt, is 
there is a growing realization amongst defense and uh, security apparatus, and even in U.S. corporations, that the way the currency system now works, this post $71 system, because of how big China's gotten, this system now amounts to the Chinese using the euro dollar system to borrow dollars, lend the dollars at a spread around the world to buy and control finite hard assets, increases their geopolitical power, increases their economic clout. Yes, they are short dollars, but only to the extent that there is a spread on the lend on the loan and to the ex they're lending it against hard asset collateral. So if the weaker emerging markets they're lending dollars to uh, defaults because the dollar gets strong, they end up with the hard asset, which is all they wanted anyway, which further increased their clout. What's more, is, and it's crazy, is because there is this dogma around Euro the euro dollar system and the post-71 dollar system must be defended at all costs uh, in certain circles, uh, and this is sort of what Mike alludes to, it must be defended at all costs, whenever the dollar squeeze gets too painful, because China is now so big, because emerging markets are now so big, the Fed comes in and effectively bails out China every time the dollar gets too strong. We saw it last March. So now you've got a Fed-backed Chinese takeover of global economies increasing their geopolitical power. And the cherry on top of this whole incredible Sunday of, of dogma I don't understand is that the U.S. military defends the whole trade lanes of, of, of the whole arrangement. So you've got the U.S. military providing protection for the trade lanes for China to bring back the hard assets of the world that are being financed by U.S. dollar, euro dollar system and backstopped by the Fed. And I guess I would ask Mike, how on earth does that make sense for the long term United States? And what I know is there have been and the numbers are growing. The number of people in the defense establishment, in the intelligence establishment are saying it doesn't make sense. It hasn't made sense for a long time. And so I would say as it relates to Bitcoin, I think that there are a lot of people in uh, in the U.S., in Washington, in the defense and intelligence establishments that want Bitcoin going a lot higher, too, for exactly the reasons you say, which is it's going to break this post seventy one dollar system. And when it does, yeah, the dollar is going to fall. Yes. You know, maybe we go from spending a trillion dollars a year on defense to spending five hundred billion, which would still put us number one in the world by far. But this in this 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 counterintuitive relationship where we you know basically we 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 backstop the chinese lbo of of the world and and defend the supply chains while they do so uh begins to make more strategic sense than it does now because right now it makes absolutely no sense yeah i mean amazing comments i must say very interesting uh let's go from the super macro back to the the short term because you know basically all of this uh, points to a dollar that's weakening but your your tactical change is of the dollar strengthening and one of the factors potentially is the fact that we're it seems to me at least that we're about to get 1.9 trillion dollars in deficit spending coming right now. Do you think that's going to happen? And how do you think that plays into what's happening with the dollar in 2021? So I, I don't have a great view on it. Is it one nine two two one four? The there, There's a lot better people to talk to than me in terms of the internal politics of it. But I think to your point, your broader point, that a lot is coming. Um, and what does that mean for the dollar? I think ultimately comes down to does the Fed buy enough of it or does the Fed not buy enough of it? And if they buy enough of it, which is to say most or all of it or more than all of it, then I think the dollar weakens like we saw in 2020. And if they don't buy enough of it, as right now is the plan, um, then I think the dollar goes up and I think stocks go up and I think rates keep rising. It's this this Soros, Strzok and Miller strong dollar playbook um, until something breaks. And because again, because debt and the, the debt around the world, dollar debt especially, is so high. Uh, because um, you know that that's going to eventually squeeze global markets, right? Where they've got to start selling assets uh, to raise dollars, uh, either for working capital purposes or to repay dollar debt uh, uh, payments. The problem, and again, this ties back to how this system has evolved and why it's so dysfunctional at this point, and why we're ultimately bearish, uh, still bearish, very bearish at dollar is. 
Uh, the U.S. net international investment position is negative 60 percent of GDP, negative six zero percent after uh, after the COVID crisis. So uh, in 1998, by way of comparison, it was negative three percent in 08. It was negative eight percent. It's negative 60. And so most Many, I won't say most, because but many uh, analysts and economists are still evaluating this dollar-centric emerging market weakness, squeeze the emerging markets with the dollar playbook using the 98 lens of negative 3% net international investment position for the U.S. or the 08 playbook, negative 8%. The reality is it's negative 60%, which means they have plenty of dollars. They're just sitting in U.S. dollar assets. And if we make them monetize those dollar assets to raise dollars because the dollar's gotten too strong, they're going to crash our markets. And that's exactly what we saw in March. Uh, all the, all the postmortems discuss how they basically were crashing the treasury market, uh, raising, wagering money because you sell what you can, not what you want to. And the, the deepest, most liquid market in the world couldn't even handle the volume for a few, uh, for a few trading days. Um, and so that's the problem within all this because our economy is critically dependent on asset appreciation. And that's why I say this strong dollar playbook uh, it's a counter move. Um, I don't think it'll last very long. I want to be cognizant of it for our clients. Uh, but uh, you know, me personally, I haven't changed any positioning. Um, I'm unlevered. I don't day trade it. But it's one of these things where you can see, OK, we're going to get this counter move in the dollar. But the structure of how things are, you know, how dependent we are on asset appreciation, how short foreigners are of dollars and how long they are of dollar denominated assets you can see the dollar's not going to be able to rise very far before it creates a problem. And then there's two choices for the Fed. You let the whole system collapse, and that's a possibility. It's not a very high possibility. Or you come in again and you say, okay, guys, we were just kidding about the whole we're not going to buy enough treasuries. We're going to buy enough now, and that's when we're going to get another you know, $625 billion a week in QE kind of thing, except it might be a trillion a week. I mean, who knows? Right. You know, um, I'm looking at the time here, and even though we're only 40 minutes through, I have so many questions, I'm going to start to introduce some of them. Sure. Um, and, you know, the first question that I have requires a little bit of a background. There was a uh, there was a video with your friend Brent Johnson, who interviewed Russell Napier on the platform here in November. And basically, the gist that I get from it is, is that Russell was saying that when you look at the low inventories that we're having, and you also look at the money supply increase, there is the potential for inflation, you know, not high inflation, but 4%, which is relatively high. And so the first question is from Thomas, who wants to talk about that thesis. Here's what he says. He says, my question relates to the deflation inflation debate. I wonder if Luke is aware of Russell Napier's thesis, which, by the way, he lays out in Real Vision in conversation with Brent Johnson. Does Luke agree with it as uh, the channel through which inflation will eventually flow into the economy if he could also make comments on financial repression as Napier sees it amid the chaos uh, that Luke expects? So I agree with Napier. Uh, I agree with the, the financial repression. And I think the transmission mechanism is not so much on the inventory side, although I think that'll be a contributor. But I think it is something else that uh, Napier alluded to, if not in that interview, then elsewhere, which was uh, government has basically um, fiscal dominance. The government is now basically uh, increasingly taking control of central banks and that is ultimately inflationary. It ties into his money supply point. And that's where I think we're really almost in between two trapezes in terms of the deflation inflation debate. And it's not well understood yet. And that's really, I think, the opportunity ties back to your point earlier of, of higher, higher yields at the long end. Uh, but my point is, is if you look under the post $71 system and particularly post 1980, so this encompasses basically everybody trading today. We all only know that, hey, inflation rises when private sector lending rises. And so as, as, as long as the U.S. banking system isn't lending, the long that loan growth isn't really growing, and it hasn't been uh, since 08, really, uh, then we don't have to worry about inflation. That is true until you marry the Fed and Treasury. Uh, until you and and what the, basically what we've been calling uh, the, the, the Chinese economy with U.S. characteristics. And we saw the U.S. run that playbook in 2020, and we saw plenty of inflation right away. You start handing money to people, they spend it, 
you get inflation. We're seeing that in the metrics. Uh, the uh, ISM prices paid highest since 11 this week. Uh, ISM and non-manufacturing ISM prices paid near the highest since 11. So you, it's it's they were they've been able to not only fill in the hole, but now we're back to 10, 15 year highs in inflation, inflationary readings. And so when you look at it that way, you need to start. I, and that's why I say between the two trapezes. Everyone's still holding on to the, well, we can't get inflation until we have private sector bank lending growth trapeze. And the trapeze they should be moving toward is U.S. bank loans to the U.S. government were up 30, 35 percent last year. And they're probably going to be up another 30, 35 percent this year and the year after and the year after. And then U.S. bank loans to the U.S. government are just treasury purchases. You just watch the treasury purchase. And people say, well, that's just because they're being safe. They're afraid to lend. And yes, they can't find things to lend to. And that's part of the problem. Uh, but again, that it's also because they're being regulated into it. Uh, when you look at the regulations, and at the end, it doesn't really matter. They're loans. There is no functional difference between a bank loan and a bond. Uh, there's a slight structure, but they are both effectively lending. And so the the U.S. banking system is rapidly growing lending to the U.S. government. And in the in the short term, they may not be growing it enough relative to how much the U.S. is borrowing. Uh, but ultimately. They're going to have to buy whatever, you know, the Fed's going to have to monetize whatever they monetize. And we can look out at the U.S.'s spending. And uh, in the aftermath of COVID, now, number one, tax receipts are rolling over, uh, which is uh, disconcerting, to say the very least. Um, and in the aftermath of COVID and 3Q20, if you look at the big three expenditures of the United States, so defense, entitlements, and interest expense and treasury spending, those three uh, we're 140 percent of tax receipts, 135 percent tax receipts. So tell me what we're going to cut. Are we going to cut defense in the middle of a great power competition with China? We're going to cut entitlements when we've got literally the capital being raided out of social frustration and our numerous cities burned all summer. Are we going to cut interest on treasuries? Are we going to cut the stimulus checks? OK, there's nothing there's nothing to cut. And so I think the inflation transition is happening real time. We're watching it. People don't realize it yet. The game's already changed. Uh, and as the real impetus, the real fuel for inflation is going to be government spending. All of a sudden, for the first time in any of our careers, private bank lending is not going to be the warning signal. You're never going to see it. If you're looking over here, you're going to get blindsided like a hockey player at the, at the, at the blue line, right? Just boom. The real threat <laughs> for inflation is is U.S. government spending that the banks are effectively monetizing. And so financial repression, yeah, there is, and that ties back to our initial point, which I think is the $64,000 question in markets today. I've been thinking it, I continue to think it, which is what's the level on the 10-year where the Fed has to come in, number one, where something breaks, and then the Fed has to come in and say, okay, um, you know, we're not going to let the 10-year rise above this, period, full stop. And right. the is going to be our balance sheet. And that's going to be, it's closer than people think. And that's going to send real rate. People think, you know, one of my big things coming into 2021 was people think real rates bottomed in August at negative 1.1%. Uh, uh, that was that was consensus coming into this year. I still think it's a pretty consensus view. I, I think real rates are going to negative 5, negative 10, maybe lower. Um, I, I don't think negative 1.1 is even in the right zip code for how low they're going. And that speaks really well for, for Bitcoin, and it speaks really well for gold if, if people let it off the mat. I mean, you've got record physical sales. You've got very strong, and, and the price is falling. So, I mean, who knows? Uh, those are moving, you know, real rates and gold are moving separate ways right now, which shouldn't be happening. Very interesting. Let me take a pause in the questions because, you know, uh, I have my own uh, thoughts on that. It's interesting because Albert Edwards, he was saying 1.50. That's his trigger point, uh, something to watch. So really not that far off. When you were talking about uh, fiscal dominance, I was thinking actually about the consolidated balance sheet approach. That's this concept uh, within the MMT circles that says that just look at the Fed as a agent of the government. Uh, basically, they're doing the government's bidding. Mm -hmm. And when push comes to shove, the government will encapsulate them and they'll move hand in glove. And that's what we're seeing right now, the consolidated balance sheet. The question I have with regard to inflation on that has to do with Japan, because arguably Japan, they've been doing consolidated balance sheets for 
years. And they're at you know t over 200 percent debt to GDP. The Bank of Japan is the dominant force in the JGB market at this point in time. And yet, they have not been able to get inflation higher. What's different for the world's reserve currency, uh, the U.S., than has been for Japan when they've been trying to do this? So I think that the, the world reserve currency is one thing. Uh, the fact that we have it and they don't is one element of it in the short run, in the intermediate run even. In the long run, the thing that's different can be seen by putting up a chart ranking countries, regions by current account balance, right? So I'm going to have it backwards here on the chart, right? So let me see here, here, right? Okay. So for the viewer, this should be left, this should be right. Okay. So when you look at a current account balance and you rank them by currency region, right, right, by region, right? So you've got the EU is number one over here. They're the biggest. You've got Japan, which is like number two, like right here. And then you've got China, which is right here. Then you get a bunch of countries here that are basically sort of, you know, slight current account surplus and a bunch of countries that are slight current account deficits. Then you got the UK here and then you got the US and I, I can't even use my fingers. It's like I'd have to use my whole forearm. The US is like here, right? The, right. the current account deficit is so big. And the point is that China has been running a current account surplus this whole time while they've been doing this, right? So they're still net, they're, they're, they're not, and that's number one. Number two, they financed internally. So they're running a current account surplus and they're financing internally, whereas the U.S., uh, you know, with their own domestic savings, whereas the U.S. is a massive deficit and has historically financed externally. So we, we need the, the, the kindness of strangers, if you will. Um, the other thing that is different is, is we have the, we've effectively provided a, a significant portion of, of Japan's military umbrella for them. Um, over those years, and we have to finance our own military. And so when you that's part of the current account balance equation, so I don't want to overstate that. But the point is that in plain English, what that means is the current account balance, as long as it's positive, keeps the amount of monetization that they have to do, the MMT, it manages it for them. They have a, they have a counterbalance. We have no counterbalance. It is like Florida, you know, gas to the floor, 100 miles an hour off the cliff. There is no counterbalance with the current account where it is. The only counterbalance has been the current account or excuse me, the reserve currency status. And really the governor on that, and this is something uh, I think a lot of the MMT in the U.S. Uh, don't appreciate as much as they should are the geopolitical angles. Right. So the things we talked about before, where all of a sudden there's this competitor, China, and they're a big economy and they're offering 200 bips plus to what we have. Um, and then the multi-currency commodity complex was sort of the part of another big part of the enforcement of why the global reserve currency kept us from having a problem. So you've got, you know, global central banks no longer sterilizing our deficits, uh, a competitor and uh, this multi-reserve, multi-currency energy uh, pricing, commodity pricing, the expansion of this. Uh, begins to shift it back to this. Everybody's everybody's central bank has to finance their own current account deficits. And the reality is the Japanese don't have a current account deficit to finance. They have a surplus. We've got a massive one. And so I, to me, the people expecting that are holding up the Japanese example as, oh, well, we'll never, it'll never happen to us. Uh, inflation won't happen because we're 20 years behind the Japanese and they still don't. I think they're going to be shocked. I think it's going to come much faster. Inflation is going to come much faster, much harder. Um, and maybe it'll get explained away, but it's but it, I think it's common. And that that's the difference, really. Right. Now, uh, here's the second question for you. This is from Angela. She says, uh, you previously described your fastest way for the U.S. government to deal with their massive 130 percent debt to GDP issue by increasing the price of gold. This solution is so logical, being a neutral currency to devalue against. So what's holding them back? <laughs> dogma. It's dogma. It ties back to the, um, the point we talked about earlier, about there is still a very big contingent in Washington that sees the dollar reserve status as structured post-71, uh, the be-all, end-all. I would, too, if, you know, when you want, as the Washington Post said, seven of the 10 richest or wealthiest counties in America surround Washington, D.C. So, you know, it, it's difficult to get a man to see something when his salary depends upon his not seeing it. Right. So 
Washington's salary depends upon their the, this dollar system, uh, even though it's to the detriment of the United States now and has been, and even though it's increasingly to the detriment of Washington, um, as I described before about how we're effectively financing the Chinese and protecting them with our own military. Uh, but it's really this, you know, what was called in going into the 2008 crisis, the beginning when people started to see it, it was called YBG, IBG. Yeah, it's a dangerous position, but YBG, IBG, you'll be gone, I'll be gone. And so that's this view in Washington. Well, you know, dogma, dollar good, dollar good, dollar good. And, and there's no, you can't argue that in some circles. And I think that circle is still in control. Um, and uh, this YBG, IBG, well, even if it does go wrong, it's not for 20 years. So who cares? Um, you know, and so it, it, in the end, it's dogma, uh, but it would be. It, it, it's very clean. It's very elegant. It would very, be very good for the United States. And just for, for the, 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 the viewers that are uh, unaware of that, my point, what I said was, is the U.S. fiscally is in a, an irrecoverable position. We were we, this, this Soros struck and Miller playbook. We ran it in the early 80s. Volcker did. We defended the dollar, took rates up, put us into double severe recession. The challenge is that they can't raise rates in any real way, to your point earlier, without making it worse because the debt to GDP is so high. And so the first thing you need to do to fix the situation is get the GDP, debt to GDP, down to a level where you can significantly raise rates without breaking the system. And the reality is, is that was sort of the playbook discussed post-08. Well, we'll just grow out of it. Well, we did. Um, we're sitting here at 130% now. We were at whatever, 80% back then and, and going higher. So you need to get the debt to GDP down really fast. And there is a, a, a point in the, or a, a portion that was pointed out to me in the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve Bank operating manual. It says that the, it's right there in black and white. If the Treasury tells the Fed to revalue the gold higher, the revaluation amount gets put into the Treasury General Account, or TGA. And the TGA, can, they can spend however they want. It's just an accounting creation. It's gimmicky. It's wonkish. It's no different than, than Paul uh, Krugman recommending the trillion-dollar platinum coin, except <laughs> with gold. Oh, he used platinum, but it's the same damn thing. So uh, the challenge is our debt's so high, you'd have to revalue gold enormously. It's basically $4,000. Every $4,000 on gold is a trillion dollars in, in in, in, into the TGA, right? So if you took gold to $50,000 an ounce, as incredible as that sounds, you would be putting $12 trillion, give or take, into the TGA. And then you could stimulate, you could build infrastructure, you could build education, uh, you could do all these things that would take GDP up enormously over the next several years. And at the end of that, not even over the next several years, a year from now, debt to GDP could be 60, 65%. And now the Fed can normalize rates after this de facto significant devaluation of the dollar. And mm -hmm. so it's really the only way out at this point, in my view. Um, you're not going to grow out of it. You're not going to default on the debt. Um, and so the question is really, when does the dogmatic crowd that doesn't want to do this, when do they, you know, when do they see enough pain? When does it hurt them enough in their own house uh, to, to make the inevitable decision? It's ultimately the same decision in a different way that Nixon made. It's the same decision uh, that uh, FDR made 30 years before that, it's, or 40 years before that. These things just happen. So uh, that's why I think it hasn't been done yet. Interesting. You know, uh, by the way, just as an aside, I uh, remember uh, I'm uh, friends with uh, two guys, uh, Lee Quaintance and uh, Paul Brodsky of QB Partners. And we had a post that I posted on my website, Credit Write Downs, back in August of 2010. And it was uh, entitled QE3, a plan to stabilize the global monetary system. And they were talking about this revaluation gambit. But back then, the numbers that they were coming up with were 5,000, revaluing gold to a 5,000 level. So I, I would think that, you know, we're talking about a much higher number at this point in time. So, It'd be a much higher number. Yeah, and those, yeah. both of those guys are brilliant. So, yeah, they uh, uh, absolutely have influenced my thinking over the years. I, I think I, I vaguely remember that post uh, uh, way back then. So. So uh, l let me go back to this inflation uh, question, because Cyrus, he has a question where he says, uh, what are Luke's views on the kind of inflation he expects? Uh, reshoring of supply chains and one-off supply chain shocks are one thing and may well be temporary, but how does he interpret falling velocity of money and lower bank lending uh, uh, to households and to SMEs when analyzing inflation? So for me... I think 
inflation is going to be high. I don't think it will be called high. I think it will be, you know, I think we're going to be looking at, I don't know, 10% plus inflation that'll be reported as three or four, um, which is a really good setup for, uh, for, for stocks, by the way. Uh, but um, to me, monetary velocity as you know, it's, it's, it's derivative of, of MV equals PQ, right? It's the, the amount of money times the velocity, the money equals the, the inflation level times GDP, right? And real GDP. And to me, the problem with monetary velocity is really twofold. Number one, uh, Professor uh, Werner, Richard Werner, has done a tremendous job on, on uh, uh, Real Vision and elsewhere talking about really you need to strip velocity into two components. You need to look at asset in inflation and then real economy inflation. And we simply, by virtue of the dollar's reserve status post-71 and how it's structured, we needed to not build factories and real stuff here in the U.S. We needed to run deficits. And so the, the way the system worked was we need everybody else to have high rates of real inflation, build stuff, factories, infrastructure like China, Japan, Mexico, et cetera, have done to supply us. And we will have high asset price inflation. This, this asset price inflation, the velocity of asset prices uh, inflation has been much has been very high uh, and continues to be very high, but it's not factored in velocity. So that's I think problem number one with velocity. I think to the as we keep moving toward this multi currency system where everybody's central bank is responsible for financing everybody's government, uh, velocity and real stuff is going to pick up too. With that said, it's a little bit velocity is a little bit of a a plug number, right? So we we know the money supply sort of. It's a very dated view, and it doesn't it doesn't account for numerous things. And guys like Jeff Jeff Snyder at Alhambra have done a great job of highlighting how little the Fed really understands what's really in money supply. So okay, so of MV equals PQ, we really don't know M. Velocity is a plug. Inflation we systemically underreport. We have to. That's and that's that's not you know that's you, you ask guys like Harold Malmgren who've been around government for sixty years. He goes, look, we always do it. Everybody does it. So you're understating inflation, which also uh, 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 really hurts that calculation, right? It, it distorts the the implied value of velocity, and GDP. We also really don't know, right? When you start talking about increasingly increasing productivity, are we measuring it right? What's what's the value of an iPhone relative to you know the technology? So basically, people say, well, velocity is falling and falling. Um, but we don't we don't know M. We understate P, and we don't really know Q, uh, um, uh, Q. So what's really the value of V? Yeah, it's directionally helpful, and that even assumes that we continue to ignore asset velocity relative to real velocity. So, I, I, to me, I think if we're waiting for velocity to uh, signal a sign of a pickup in inflation, I think again it's going to be like the hockey player looking the wrong way at the blue line. You're going to get killed. Um, where I think inflation comes from is not that bank lending. It's really the government, right? We are now in 2020, we ran the Chinese economic model, an MMT type model where the US government spent and the Fed and the banks bought the treasuries. And so you've got the Fed and the banks financing the government, the, the government's deciding where the money goes. And we can have a whole political discussion about how wise that is, how inefficient. I don't care. As far as inflation is concerned, that's inflationary. And the problem with that model is, is you know, it's it's in my favorite band is Guns N' Roses. It's it's like the Mr. Brownstone song about heroin addiction, right? I used to do a little, but the little wouldn't do it, so the little got more and more. What are we hearing? Uh, well, you know, we did it last year, but we'll stop. Well, we're gonna you know defer student loans, and now Schumer wants to forgive student loans, and you know, even Romney wants three thousand bucks a kid today. Uh, it was out hitting the tape, right? So this isn't even the far left uh, recommendation who wants moving, you know, so you. They've opened Pandora's box. If you're looking for increasingly, if you're looking for private sector loan growth as a signal of inflation, you're not going to see it. The, the the signal for inflation is U.S. deficits, and it's telling you inflation's coming. 
Yeah, you know, I'm looking at our time. We're over. I usually go, uh, leave it at an hour, but I'm, if you're okay with that, uh, uh, we'll ask a few more questions. I'll sure. try to combine some of them. Yeah, I'll try uh, to be a little bit more short, short, uh, short winded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's 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 do that. Uh, here's the first. I have two questions that are related. Okay, so the one is. Uh, why are higher UST rates not attracting more capital? This is from Jimmy Mack. And a related question, and I think this is the real question, Luke, what is your gut telling you the, is the breaking point on the 10-year UST? So combine those two, that we're moving up, capital's not being attracted, uh, but because of the UST rate, uh, Jimmy Mack is saying, and then at what level do you have this breaking point? So the reason it's not attracted yet is I think you have to watch the FX hedge treasury yield, not just the nominal treasury yield. And so after you adjust for the FX hedging costs, which are ultimately a fluid function of relative currency rates, what that's saying in plain English is, is after you hedge for the dollar, the JGB is still more attractive. For example, so you know, to a to a Japanese investor, after you hedge for the dollar, you can still get a modestly higher yield on JGBs than you can on Treasuries. And so until that changes. That that's really um, that's going to continue. Now, the dollar keeps rising. That's that's the the treasury will keep getting less attractive, and so it's uh, that's why I think it becomes self limiting ultimately. Treasury yield, I, I don't have a great feel for it. Uh, what I would say is people whose views I respect, ranging from Albert Edwards at one five, uh, I've heard others say one seven, one seven five. Um, that's probably where a good a place as any, but I just don't have a great framework, A, for evaluating it, and B, what I would say is that ultimately when something breaks is, is the number. So it's a little bit of, a, you know, when have we gone too far? Oh, we went too far. We're already, you know, we're already past. And, and do you think that the velocity of the move uh, has any impact on where that level is? Meaning that, you know, if you go up to 150 over a short, of a, over a long period of time, that's a different case than, you know, ramping up to 150 straight away. I think it's a great point, Edward. I think anything that happens fast is destabilizing, given how much leverage there is. And we need to look no further than what happened to GameStop last week, right, which is a systemically unimportant company. Um, and yet we we had chaos as a result of it moving as fast as it did, as much as it did. And so I think it, if I was the Fed, I would be trying to sort of walk the long end up methodically, slowly, very predictably, so as to avoid exactly what you say, which is a real sharp move that runs the risk of getting somebody off sides and then forcing degrossing, like we saw last week, across the leveraged complex, which then creates more problems for the Fed than it solves. Yeah, uh, here's a, a question on investing. Dan B is asking, as the dollar loses value, uh, do we continue to go long commodities and EM? The short answer is yes. The longer version is... Um, uh, no, that, that's the short version. That's a long version, too. Ultimately, is when you have a multi-currency energy system, multi-currency increasingly pricing of commodities and energy specifically, the, 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 the pivot for commodity inflation increasingly becomes the cross rate between the dollar and other currencies. So if you want commodity inflation, you got to get the dollar down and vice versa. Great. Uh, here's Gordon. So if it comes down to a face off between the Fed, big banks on the one side and the DOD on the other side with regard to what we were talking about uh, with uh, the current dollar system, how does this play out? <laughs> I would bet on the guys with the guns and the haircuts like mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, in all seriousness, it is. Um, eh. It, it, they, it, it's a fascinating thing. I said this to a friend of mine last week. When you look at Bitcoin as sort of a tech thing, if you will, um, if, if, you, if you make it a tech thing, a technology reserve currency, you look at the two critical elements of U.S. soft power. Um, and over the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, have been two things, banking and technology. And so the two critical elements of U.S. soft power Bitcoin represents a fight between the two of them. And who's going to win? Uh, if left to its own devices, I think I think Bitcoin and the tech guys win. But the challenge is, is the tech guys have, you know, when you look at what the tech guys have inter disintermediated, when they've gone after disintermediating in industries, they are undefeated all time. 
And when you look at the banking system and leveraging the dollar, they too are undefeated all time. And so you've really got like a, a Tyson Holyfield fight between two pillars of US soft power um, with two very different ideas about what is good for US hegemony and what is not. And I think the DOD comes down on the side of the of, of really implicitly the tech guys, which is we're better off having high tech, neutral reserve asset driven productivity growth, real growth, than we are this trying to maintain this dollar centric system that benefits the banks first via the Cantillon effect, um, but which hollows out and has hollowed out the US economy to such an extent that DOD has been raising the alarm for five years, 10 years, listen, our supply chains are vulnerable. We, key, we, mm -hmm. we are running the risk of being operationally ineffective in certain theaters as a result of being too dependent on certain elements uh, uh, from China uh, in particular, which is a function of the dollar system that the banks want to keep. Yeah. Um, l l I'll, let's have two more questions. And uh, I think I'm looking at what the questions are. Let me here are the two questions I'm going to ask you. First, the first question is here from Michael L. Can you address the potential impacts of energy supply constraints, i.e. regulation, capital investment in the U.S. and how it feeds into the inflation transition? It's a it's a great question because it, it when you see what Biden has done so far, it points to higher energy inflation, I think. Um, and when you do that, then you start to, um, it starts a feedback loop where part of what has supported the dollar over the last six, seven years has been increasing, decreasing U.S. energy imports, right? So as we produced more of our own, we have, ex, you know, that, that whole trade was energy and dollars out. And as there were, as we have fewer dollars out because we had less energy in, fewer dollars out into a euro dollar system that requires a lot of dollars just to keep going, you're creating this artificial dollar scarcity. Not artificial. You're creating a dollar scarcity that that supports the dollar overall. And so, if you run that loop in reverse, you end up with more U.S. You end up with more uh, oil in, more dollars out. All else equal, it's negative dollar. And as that feedback loop happens, then it, it supports more inflation because we're still running a five hundred billion dollar trade deficit, right? So the price of those goods start going up uh, relative to other currencies. So I think what we're seeing in some of these supply chains for energy are inflationary, um, and ultimately further inflationary because then it starts incentivizing uh, the transition that they want to, they clearly want to make anyway on the climate side, right? When I see ads with Will Ferrell saying GM's going to have 25 new electric cars by 2025, like that to me is really interesting, right? So you start seeing inflation in other commodities that are tied into that supply chain. But again, it actually looks like probably a, a, a way to touch off a smart strategic move for the United States. Um, and really, moving away from, from you know, incentivizing and moving away from sort of the traditional petrodollar system underpinning of that whole post-71 dollar system. Okay, so we've got only one more question for you. And I guess you could call this like the ultimate uh, real vision question, especially <laughs> because uh, we, uh, we do a lot of crypto. So here it comes. This is from Chip and also from Robert K. How do you allocate between Bitcoin and gold uh, and how does how has that changed over the last year? <laughs> um, I am about half and half on gold and Bitcoin. That has increased in Bitcoin uh, uh, pretty notably since um, the really I would say since uh, September October uh, timeframe, and in particular. Uh, when Bitcoin broke out over 20,000 from just purely a technical standpoint. Uh, but then further, about a week and a half later, if you remember, FinCEN came out with a pretty, on a Friday night, with a, what appeared to read like a pretty uh, stern uh, regulatory document as it related to cryptocurrencies. And I said to my wife, Bitcoin should be down 20, 30% tomorrow. And I woke up and Bitcoin was up 6%. And just haven't been in this business for 25 years, 
you know, the, the, the 20,000 breakout was like, okay, I'm not a big technical guy, but I've been around enough to just know like, when you break the new high, okay, like it's going high just technically. But then when you see something like that, where there's this narrative that the government's going to come down and they're going to break it. And I read this thing, I go, Ooh, I'm going to be down a lot of money in my, in my Bitcoin tomorrow. And I was up 6%. That to me suggests that there's something entirely different going on and that you need to respect that. And so those two things, that's really, and from a big picture standpoint, shame on me, I should have been there the whole time, quite frankly. But my thought process ultimately is, and why I think probably half and half is the right thing, maybe it's for, for me at least, my thought process doesn't make it right or wrong, is um, if the government really wants to break Bitcoin, there's only one way they can break Bitcoin, in my view, without shutting down the internet or really putting in pretty draconian capital controls now that it's a trillion dollar market cap. And that is raise rates to 10%, raise rates to 8%. I would be happy to take take all the money I have in crypto and, and gold and put it in treasuries at 8 or 10%. I probably wouldn't have much money left by the time they did that, actually. But the money I had left after they got done crashing, if they took rates to 10% a month, um, I would be happy to take that 10% coupon. The challenge, as I noted before, is they can't do that without bankrupting the U.S. government. The U.S. Treasury expense, treasury interest expense would be more than 100% of tax receipts. They'd be printing the money just to pay the interest, just a lot, no entitlements, no defense, nothing else. Um, and so the dollar would collapse and Bitcoin and gold would actually go crazy on a 10, move to 10% yields, paradoxically. However, if we go back to that point we made earlier, where if the government takes uh, gold to 50,000 or 25,000 or whatever, before it takes rates to five or eight or 10 or whatever they want to do it to, then uh, you, could, you could do it. And so I look at it as gold is a hedge. To me, uh, Bitcoin is superior on every metric of neutral reserve asset to gold, except for two. Number one is that gold is final payment. I hold it in my hand. There is no additional energy dividend needed, whereas Bitcoin has to you know, keep the network going, electricity, et cetera, to keep it valued. Uh, the second is, is that Bitcoin at the moment does not sit on the US government, the reserve currency issuers balance sheet in any place. And so if they do want to do a flash overnight Sunday night surprise, which, oh, by the way, has been the way the last two dollar related currency system transitions have occurred, in 1933 and 1971, if they want to do an overnight revaluation of something to reset the system, at the moment, they can't use Bitcoin. They can't. It's not on their balance sheet. They have to use gold. And so to me, um, that's why I have both. And I'm probably good where I am right now, because if if I'm wrong and Bitcoin is sort of the heir apparent, and it just does what a lot of people think it'll do. I'm going to be fine. Um, and if 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 they do use gold and I'm right there, then and to, to sort of bring Bitcoin back under some sense where it's not hyperinflating against the dollar, like it literally did from September to or October through December last year, it rose 50% per month, which is the IMF definition of hyperinflation. Uh, if they then they're going to need to use gold in some way. So I, I balance those two out. That's where I'm at. Great. Yeah, I think that was a, a very cogent response. And just all around, Luke, I just want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, pick your brain. We have to do it more often. I really enjoy these sessions. Thank you very much. I uh, always enjoy talking with you. Always uh, uh, great catching up and, and great interacting uh, on all these topics because it's a pretty exciting time. Yeah, and your your analogies, uh, the the hockey analogy, uh, <laughs> of the, of the sweet home Alabama, amazing, amazing stuff, Lou. <laughs> Thank you. You take care. Thanks, Edward. You do the same, bud. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.